Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Dear people of God, the first Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church to prepare for them by a season of penitence and fasting. This season of Lent provided a time in which converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when those who because of notorious sins had been separated from the body of the faithful were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to the fellowship of the church. In this manner, the whole congregation was put in mind of the message of pardon and absolution set forth in the gospel of our Savior and of the need that all Christians continually have to renew our repentance and faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to the observance of the Holy Lent, by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. And to make a right beginning, let us now pray for grace that we may faithfully keep this Lent. Please kneel. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of Holy Scripture. A reading from the book of Joel. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountain a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will it be again after them through the years of all generations. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain of offering and a drink offering for the Lord our God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests the ministers of the Lord weep and say, Spare our people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. 
why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please remain seated as we pray Psalm 103. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, long-suffering and of great goodness. He will not always chide us, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy also toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he set our sins from us. As a father pities his own children, so is the Lord merciful to those who fear him. For he knows whereof we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. The New Testament lesson is a reading from Paul's letters, second letter to the Corinthians. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of the salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, so sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Anoint your head and 
wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, but where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In the early 2000s, um, for about three or four years before I went to seminary, I used to work in the Florida governor's office for the office of the chief inspector general. Now, the good thing about working in the governor's office was that you actually got to work in the Florida Capitol building. You weren't relegated to some nondescript office building on kind of the fringes of Tallahassee. You were right in the middle of it all. And one of my favorite days was Ash Wednesday. Most of the downtown churches, the ones that were liturgical anyway, all had morning services. So most of those parishioners would go to church, receive their ashes, and then come to work. And for me, it was really cool because these particular employees were letting the entire world know not only who they were, but whose they were. And I love being able to identify all the other Christians in the office by their ashes on that day. In fact, there, there was a funny meme floating around the internet yesterday and it said this, Dear single women looking for a nice Catholic guy, tomorrow God will label them for you works for Anglicanism as well. But one day as I was walking into the office, one of our employees, we'll call him Fred, because that really was his name, sat down across the desk from me and said, you know what, I don't get you Christians. Why on Ash Wednesday do you walk around with ashes on your head? I mean, that's pretty morbid, isn't it? And of course, that started a long conversation with Fred. And it was in that moment that I realized why the ashes were so important. It was fun being able to identify ourselves as Christians, but it was in that question asked by a curious staffer in my office that made me realize how important the ashes are. For Ash Wednesday, we don't wear our ashes because we want to self-identify, as if wearing the ashes were some form of virtue signaling. We don't wear the ashes so that everyone can see how pious and self-righteous we are. We wear the ashes because we know that we were formed from the earth and we will return to earth one day. We wear the ashes because we know that we are wretched sinners in need of redeeming. We wear the ashes because we know who we are and we wear the ashes because we know whose we are. Sinners in need of redemption and renewal and receiving that redemption and renewal through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In our gospel lesson today, we look at a passage from Matthew chapter six that is at the center of Jesus' first discourse called the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount spans chapters five through seven and in this particular verse, Jesus takes a minute between all the teaching and the moral codes and everything to give his disciples a lesson about giving, prayer, and fasting. And all of these lessons can be summed up 
by what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. It can also be summed up by another passage in our Old Testament lesson today from the prophet Joel, when the prophet tells the people, rend your hearts and not your garments. In other words, discipleship is not about outward appearances, it's about the inward condition of the heart. And that was Jesus' point about fasting. When observing the worship in the synagogue led by the scribes and the Pharisees, they gave so that they could be praised by others for what they gave with the blowing of the trumpet and great fanfare as they brought their tithes to the altar. Jesus was calling his people to let their giving come from the heart. And if it truly came from the heart, the people didn't need to know how much they gave. Same with prayer. The hypocrites loved to pray openly so that they could be seen by others. Jesus was telling them not to pray in order to look pious to others, but to pray in secret so their father would reward them. Prayer was not done for show, it was done to connect with God. And I want to add one quick thing to that. Jesus was addressing a particular situation here and some issues with a particular group of people, the scribes and the Pharisees. He was not saying that all forms of public prayer are sinful and the only acceptable form of prayer is in your room with the door shut. It's about the heart. If your prayer is to make yourself look good in front of others, then that's a problem. However, if your heart is to pray and to lead others in prayer to glorify God and not yourself, that will bring you rewards in heaven. And the final point Jesus brings up is about fasting. Do you ever wish that you could just jump in a time machine and travel back to the first century Jerusalem and just watch these hypocrites? I mean, what, what did these dismal, disfigured hypocrites look like? Let your fasting be between you and Jesus, and your fasting will also bring you treasures in heaven. It's ultimately about the heart. Rend your hearts and not your garments. My brothers and sisters, on this Ash Wednesday, we begin the season of Lent. It's that most blessed penitential season when we slow down and we radically engage God through almsgiving, through prayer, and through fasting. It's a time when we search our hearts in repentance and we identify those areas where we still need Jesus to work in our lives, in our hearts. And it's a hard thing to do. In Lent, we become hyper aware of our sinful nature and how far we fall short of the glory of God. And dealing honestly with that can be difficult. But the ultimate goal of this is not to wallow in our own misery and just stay moping and looking dismal like those early Jewish leaders. The purpose of this is to identify what we need to lay at the feet of Jesus, who shed his blood on the cross to wash us of our sins, cleanse us, and make us whole. And when we do that, we experience renewal. We experience God's grace and his mercy in new and powerful ways. If we don't rend our hearts, we shouldn't be surprised if we don't experience renewal. 
But if we do rend our hearts and rend them constantly, then God transforms us into something much greater than we could ever be on our own. Take this time over this holy season. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Give your heart constantly to God and allow him to work in your life in amazing ways. Amen. Let us now call to mind our sin and the infinite mercy of God. Almighty God, you have created us from the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be for us a symbol of our mortality and a sign of our penitence, that we may remember that it is by your grace alone that we receive the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned through our own fault in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. 
for all our unfaithfulness and disobedience, for the pride, vanity, and hypocrisy of our lives. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For our self-pity and impatience, and for the envy of those we think more fortunate than ourselves. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For our unrighteous anger, bitterness, and resentment, and all the lies, gossip, and slander against our neighbors. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For our sexual impurity, our exploitation of other people, and our failure to give of ourselves in love. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our intemperate pursuit of worldly goods and comforts. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For our dishonesty in daily life and work, our ingratitude for your gifts, and our failure to heed your call. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For our wastefulness and misuse of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For all false judgments, for prejudice and contempt of others, and for all uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbors. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For our negligence in prayer and worship, for our presumption and abuse of your means of grace. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. For seeking the praise of others rather than the approval of God. Lord, have mercy upon us. For our failure to commend the faith that is in us. Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have sinned against you. Please join me in the prayer at the top of page 8. Show favor to your people, O God, O Lord, who, who turn to you in weeping, fasting, and prayer. For you are a merciful God, full of compassion, long-suffering, and abounding in steadfast love. You spare when we deserve punishment, and in your wrath you remember mercy. Spare your people, good Lord, spare us. In the multitude of your mercies, look upon us and forgive us. Through the merits and mediation of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people being penitent, the absolution and remission of our sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that at the last, we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. My pleasure to welcome you this morning to St. Michael the Archangel on this 
Ash Wednesday. Very, very glad you are with us um, at this early hour. And just a reminder, it is the custom and practice in the Anglican Church that all baptized believers, regardless of denomination, are welcome to receive Holy Communion, which is the very next part of our service. Another quick announcement, just a reminder that this coming Saturday from 10 to 2 in the parish hall um, is another all day so uh, with Sparrow's house. Um, so keep that in mind as well. They'll be doing the pillowcases, the same thing they did last month, uh, because there's definitely a need for that. I um, mean, I love the way that ministry is outreach focused, uh, which is something that we're working on here in this congregation um, in the next uh, couple of years. Focusing on that. Let us now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in an offering and sacrifice to God. <laughs> 